Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here and tuning into Let's Talk Stroke. I am Jerry Wald, stroke survivor, and I'm so glad you're joining me, as well as amazing guest, a neuropsychologist and a friend of mine, Dr. Karen Sullivan from Pinehurst, North Carolina. So when you guys are on, make some comments in the chat section and uh, any questions you wanna ask, please do. And so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let's bring Dr. Sullivan on. Ooh, I like that music, Jerry. Nice. <laughs> yeah, trying to trying to get a little uh, funky here. Yeah, I like um, it. It's, yeah, important. So, it's important to okay. have fun. That's right, you know, especially during these times of the, you know, this last year has been kind of crazy because of COVID. And um, can you see the comments? I, you know what? I can, and that's so cool because I can see how many people are on. Yeah, I see, and I recognize a lot of these folks too. That's awesome. I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fun. I so I'll bring up some comments. Sometimes when I have stroke survivors on, it guy it kind of gets confusing because yeah. looking at a comment and the, the confusion. So okay, but, we we got a North Carolinian on here. Hey Sharon. Yeah. Oh, let's <laughs> see. And we also have somebody that look at that. Oh, awesome! Ooh, yeah. all the South Wales too. That's fabulous. I've been there before. That's a beautiful part of the world, Mike. Yeah, Mike Peters, awesome guy from South Wales. It's awesome. I'm going to try to bring up all the, some of the comments, so I apologize if I don't. Um, but thank you for being here again. I really appreciate it. It's really, um, first of all, I want to say you've kind of changed my life as well. Well, you did just because of getting to know you and going to your stroke recovery group. That was pretty awesome. I know Salute, I saw her out here. And yeah. uh, she went as well. And oh, oh my God, we had so much fun, didn't we? It was yes, so. We did. So basically, it was these ten rules of rehab that I came up with in the Stroke Recovery Guide. But basically, we you know brought it to life in this once a week kind of a ten week session. So every rule got its own week. And we spent about an hour, an hour and a half just focusing on that one rule and, you know, having people, you know, at the end, we had a nice Q&A and people, you know, were able to get their personal questions answered. And um, yeah. it was a great community. I definitely miss doing it. And we had some special guests a couple weeks in a row. We had a praying mantis. <laughs> and <laughs> we had a yellow jacket. Um, it was uh, pretty interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, it was, it was, I, do you have any plans to do it again or maybe? You no, know, I would love to, I would love to, I would love to be able to, my dream would be to get some kind of a sponsor so I could offer it to free for people. The problem is, you know, we, you know, in trying to, to get our message out there, there's some things we do where we just have so much overhead. We have to charge a little bit yeah. to try to, you know, just make up the difference. But what we really want to do is more of these, you know, free brain health lectures every Wednesday night on our Facebook group. Um, so that would be the goal. But, you know, right now they're available for replay on the website at icareforyourbrain.com, I-C-F-Y-B backslash SRG, which is Stroke Recovery Group. So they're up there so people can purchase them for a small fee. And um, I think even if you weren't able to attend live, you would still get a lot of, uh, inf even if you have the guide, I had to do more research to fill in that time. And so there was a lot of, uh, I think, um, depth of information that was in those groups. That's not necessarily in the book, you know? Right, right. And uh, so maybe we can just start by saying, you know, who is Dr. Sullivan? I mean, your background, I mean, I know everything. I know it. And I'm actually really pleased to have you on the show and talk about it because I know so many people have commented to me personally that are probably up all night just to hear what you have to say. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm in North Carolina. Uh, I got down here after my fellowship. I took a job at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill at the School of Medicine. Um, but in a very short amount of time, realized that I was spread too thin in that kind of a role because there's expectations you're going to be a researcher, an academic, you know, kind of an administrator and a clinician. And really my heart 
is in the clinical work, meaning the one-on-one -on -one work with people. So I moved down here to Pinehurst and there was no other neuropsychologist here. So for the last seven years, I've had my own practice yeah. and we've gone through all sorts of changes. And now with COVID, we're doing just telehealth, uh, which has been well received by our patients because people who maybe the drive was too long before, because there's not a lot of neuropsychologists out there. Um, there's about 30 in the state of North Carolina, and I'm the only one for about probably like an hour of wow. Pinehurst. So we have people that tip, I and mean, we've had people come from Virginia and Florida and South Carolina. And now, uh, for the most part, people can have phone appointments, telehealth appointments with us. And also because of COVID now, a lot of different states have opened up for um, telehealth in general. So on our website too, we have kind of like a, I'm kind of thinking of myself as like a neuro navigator. So just, you know, a, a one hour phone call to hear someone's story, to give them personalized recommendations. Also, you know, I'm a big believer in that there's much too little education that happens from brain health doctor to patient person. Nice. So I think in my experience, just explaining to people what they're living with is a form of healing and empowerment. So that's kind of my my big deal is to just be a good communicator and, and personalize people's brain health recommendations. It's funny, it's pretty straightforward, but I think uh, because it's lacking so much in the traditional brain health model, people right. people really appreciate it, it seems. Yeah, and it's funny because I always think hospital, what I've learned over the years, hospital care is uh, fine for stroke, but then the aftercare, at and least for me, that's that's, exactly. that was an issue for me. And it was from talking with survivors like you, Jerry, who just, and patients of mine who just kept saying, the hospital was amazing. I loved being in rehab because I felt like I was getting personalized care and I was focused. And then people kept saying, it's like I was, you know, kicked to the curb. I was thrown off a mountaintop. It was just like a form of abandonment almost when people got home. Wow. And I thought, well, if people just had this guide and at least they would have kind of a map of knowing how to go forward. So that's why we spent almost two years. There you go. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. yeah. It's taken like two years ago. Yeah, about yeah, exactly. And so we're still like in our local hospital at First Health, they've been kind enough to support us. So every person who comes in for a stroke gets discharged with a copy of the guide. You know, it's for sale in the uh, gift shop in our local hospital and it's on our website and on Amazon. Um, but really, our goal is that every person, you know, in the United States or the world who has a stroke would at least leave with that you know, those 10 rules of rehab, even if you didn't, you know, plenty of people have strokes who have no insurance. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. what are, what are, and, and so you guys know this. I mean, you get a certain amount, especially in the United States, you get a certain amount of, you know, sessions. And if you don't make progress, you run out of sessions, you know, you're kind of a S H I T. Uh, I don't come from a privileged background. I can appreciate not having insurance or being on public assistance. And so, it's not fair that those people wouldn't have access to information. You know, if you're lucky enough to be able to motivate to get online and go on YouTube or put recommendations into practice, you should have access to high quality information. It's silly. Yeah. You know, and I know you believe that too. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I, I would love to go to you. Tell if I could probably, I don't know if my doctor would actually, because I have an appointment with a neuro, uh, neuropsychologist, but I can't believe how far out. I know. And that's one of the things that's painful, even for us now. Um, I think, you know, my new patient appointments through the practice are something like, uh, you know, May or June. And I hate that. Um, yeah. And at times we've had more doctors working for us, but right now we just have two and it's like, we're working as hard as we can. Um, we do try to have some flexibility, like if someone has had, you know, an acute uh, brain injury or a stroke, you know, we try to be able to get them in early. And that's one of the reasons the mainstream medical practice didn't really work for me because, you know, appointments are nine to 10 months out. So yeah. over time, we've been as good as, you know, the next month when we've had four or five doctors working for us. But, you know, it just ebbs and flows who's there. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> so true. Because. My wife, Barbara, goes through this with me. 
And uh, first of all, it's it's absolutely amazing because when she, when I got kicked to the curb, we had, uh, maybe that's not the term to use, but when I got discharged, yeah, it's like, okay, now what do I do? And she had no clue what to do. Right, exactly. And so that's the, what was tough about writing it is you want it. There are these rules that apply to everyone's brain and everyone's neuroplasticity, but things also have to be personalized because your brain is unique going into the stroke. Your stroke was unique. Your recovery is going to be unique. So that's why it's interactive. So people can write in it, personalize it, um, you know, make it their own. So it, 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 that's why I think it took so long is um, Carrie Fry, the illustrator of the book, we had so many uh, ways that we were trying to be creative about making it the most useful guide that it right. could be people. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, so much, uh, so many comments. I'm trying to keep up with them, but, uh, um, but, you know, I'm going through, uh, let's see, I went through a, a, a video. I can't believe it's about maybe two years old. Um, it was called the uh, Tas Tasmanian Healthy Brain Project. Yeah. yeah. Something about that. And I, I was very interested in that. Well, you know what's funny, Jerry, is I read so many things and I, you know, I try to do a free brain health lecture on Facebook once a week. So believe it or not, the memory doctor does not remember that specific. <laughs> yeah. However, I will tell you. The, the current neuroscience on that kind of thing, they, they used to try to do, you know, clinical research. And what they would do is look at the impact of diet, look at the impact of cognitive stimulation, look at the impact of exercise. And the truth is, is that they just were not finding a lot of power. Each thing individually was helpful, but a smidge. So what the new brain health projects are doing is they're trying to make these uh, multidisciplinary programs where it's everything. It's an anti-inflammatory diet. It's unique exercise. It's socialization. It's cognitive engagement. So that's really the wave of the future for brain health is not just going down a rabbit hole of one thing. It's trying to figure out how everyday life can be your rehab. Everything is a rehab opportunity. Right, right. And this, this is like, like behind, behind it. it on page 50. Um, you probably know this by heart. But on page 50, you talk about, you know, and I love this because I read this all the time that it bring, bring on what's familiar. Oh, yeah, I love that. That's the whole idea of personalized brain health care. And that's what kind of drives me a little bit nutty <clears throat> with this idea that people should just go to a rehab um, program and it's the same cookie cutter exercises for everyone. First, it depends where in your brain you had your stroke. Right. It depends on your age. It depends on the rest of your brain health. It depends on, you know, motivation is a funny thing after a brain injury. All too often, I think we put it on the individual like it is a almost like a spiritual trait. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, like, it's separate from your brain. The truth of the matter is brain injury absolutely affects motivation. Somebody could have the intellectual idea that they want to do four hours a day of rehab, but if certain parts of their brain aren't working well, they're not going to be able to make the plan to see it through. They're not going to have the initiative to get started. Right. And you know, sometimes there's a lot of people who don't have support people. You know, you're so lucky with Barb. It seems like she's really your partner in this recovery and she gets you going when you might not want to go. And she, you know, is always looking out for new interventions. Not everybody has that, you know, so it's not as easy as well, you know, people will find it if, if they're motivated, no, it should be readily available. We should work with people to make it commonplace. Right. Right. And it's so funny this morning, um, <laughs> Barb's uh, hand was hurting and I have one of those things just for like carpal tunnel because yeah. I overuse my, um, good i hate to say my good hand my unaffected hand yeah and i said yeah mine hurts too she goes why does everything that I, she says she <laughs> hurts for her i always have her you know why can't i have my own issue she says oh my goodness oh, yeah so mike well, peters yeah i see all these people i mean everyone here is so supportive all these comments are so awesome um somebody said you know we need to get this on a, a more national stage and gosh that is the exact thing that's just been on my in my mind so much during this quarantine is 
is wishing that it could be a there's a platform somehow that people could access this information for free. That's why I'm so uh, hell bent on trying to find, because I don't think the brain health community necessarily has the funds to sponsor their own rehabs at the depth and quality they deserve. Right. Yet there's all of these corporations out there that seemingly, you know, pharmaceutical companies, uh, all of this, there's so much, resources so we've been trying to spend the last couple months trying to find bridges you know maybe there's a grant we could get or maybe there we could go on the local news like there's yeah. just but you know it's so hard because it's all about opportunity and it feels sometimes like everyone else has the power you know and so we're just if anyone has any ideas or you know that's why we work so hard to do these kind of shows is to just spread the word because it's just information we're not selling a product, you know, it's simply education and it's amazing how powerful it is. I mean, that's why I think people get so passionate about what we're trying to do is if you don't understand why you're having a symptom or why you're struggling or what to do about it, like that's a form of suffering. And it's, I mean, it's, all I know is, you know, the U S but what I can tell you is almost all the research is done with federal grant money, right? right? And so why then is it that the results are just published in academic journals? It just seems right. like it's for other scientists, you know? So all I try to do is kind of be a translator from those high level academic worlds back to people. And I, you know, I wish more doctors uh, spent more time with their patients face to face talking about those things. Yeah, exactly. And how can, because I, I read again, uh, how can, can we talk about some uh, the three days of gratitude? Oh yeah, that's awesome, huh? Yeah, that's a really that's a, a important thing that really speaks to the power of your mindset. And you know, I don't want to minimize that because how hard is it to keep having a positive mindset if you feel like you can't get the help that you need, you don't right. have support in your life. You might not have the money to buy all of the gadgets that look on the internet like, oh my God, if I only had that, you yeah. know what I mean? So your mindset is so important. And so what the research tells us is that really the best way to help a positive mindset is to be mindful, be in the moment and be grateful for what you have, which yeah. is hard because we also don't want people to invalidate their pain and right. their limitations because you also have to get real about what you lost and grieve it and rebuild and find the meaning. Right. You know, that's a whole huge, that could be a two year therapy for someone, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, so the idea, and you know, my, my, my hero, my queen, Oprah, she's the one who came up with this, um, that for 30 days, every day, write down three things that you're grateful for. And, you know, it's usually a hierarchy, you know, I'm grateful I have a home. Um, right. you know, before we talked, I was turning on the heat in my room here. And I, in my mind thought, oh, I'm so grateful I have this heater. The people who own this house before me had a heater put in this porch because otherwise I'd be freezing, you know? So it's just, it's just training yourself to over time, just notice the things that you actually have and not focus so much on the, what you don't have, but yeah. way easier said than done. Sure. sure. Yeah. And I don't know if you know, Yvonne, she's from Athens, Green. Oh, nice. Oh my God. I, I would love to go there. Those pictures of Greece are just amazing, right? Yeah. 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 There, there's so many, uh, I'm sure you see the comments, but uh, yeah, they're so sweet. I just want to say too, like the caregiver experience is a whole yeah. other world of neglect. And um, I mean, people are within an instant sent home with someone and assumed to be a nurse, a psychologist, a social worker, a chef, a house cleaner, um, you know, information gatherer and you know, there's very, very little support for caregivers. It's an absolute crime. And never mind the financial burden. on You know, some other countries have stipends that people who are providing care for someone, right. get, you know, and it's ridiculous. You know, supposedly the richest country in the world can't find their way into a system that supports people when they're down. Yeah, it's so, it's so true. It's like... 
I keep thinking of my relationship with Barbara. It is so funny because she always says, um, like I joke around, I say, well, when you have a stroke, then you'll see how this is. She goes, when when you become a caregiver, you'll see how it, it's, you know. Right. It, it's, too, it's too, like, I think it's two parallel experiences, but that are very unique. Yeah, know? yeah. And the other thing, and we talked about this in our stroke recovery group that we did for those 10 weeks, Jerry, is the impact of stroke on relationships. Right. I and the tendency is to not talk about it. A, we're so busy with care and doing all this other thing, but it's also like, you know, people aren't trained in psychology. People don't know how to bring it up or to have those conversations. So we had talked in one of the groups about how to, um, you know, broach those topics because the worst thing is to not address that things have changed. Right, right. Yeah, we do talk about that now. Yeah. So, um, oh, did, let's see. Oh, okay. So uh, was it Carrie that put the... Yeah, she's got. Oh, that's right. awesome! Thank you, Carrie. That's really cool because I was gonna um, put it in the comments. The uh, at least the thing about the, with the guide, stroke recovery guide. The, oh, yeah. You know, you're right. Everybody should have one of these, especially leaving the hospital. I wish I would have known. Oh, and that's the other way. You know, folks have tried to help us is um, to get, you know, if you happen to bond with a nurse or a doctor or your rehab person is, you know, yeah. you can get in touch with us and, you know, we can send them a free copy, see if maybe they want to partner with us. Cause how it worked, you can kind of show the back there, Jerry. What we did with our local hospital is they basically put an ad on the back. Yeah. That way, you know, it gets branded as part of their educational things. And then basically they just pay us for the ad and that's what covers the printing. So with First Health here, um, I think they they got like a thousand copies or two thousand copies or something like that. And when they run out, Carrie's nice enough to bring them over there. And um, that, you know, that's the power that's realistic. That is within our realm is okay locally we can get this thing to everybody in our community but yeah we're just, we're just one community in central north carolina you know we we so badly want because your folks know this but i don't know if my community the brain health doctors understand the suffering that happens when you don't know what to do and that's ridiculous that's ridiculous there's no reason that should be acceptable I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, I know we, we talked this before about this. Uh, you doing another class? I mean, I, yes. It is so valuable. I got so much out of it. I missed out of ten. I missed one. No, but, you're uh, so good. You're so um, you're such a great role model for this community, Jerry, because you're so <laughs> positive and you're so motivated, and everybody just loves Jerry. So. Uh, your example the, is, is wonderful. You're the you're the best. Aww. Oh my god! And what about a um, cognitive? Um, was it cognitive reserve or something like that? Oh yeah, that's one of the most important things to talk about. So that's the idea that you can, through you know the rules of neuroplasticity. That's basically what the book is about. Is how can you make deposits in your brain bank? So that, you know, the it's actually built around the idea of dementia. So the idea is there was a study done about 15 years ago now on Alzheimer's disease, and they looked at people who uh, passed away and they looked at their brain and they found that about 25% of people who had the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's in their brain didn't have memory problems in real life. And so they looked at that one in four, that 25%. And basically they tried to analyze their lifestyle and say, well, what made them unique? You're getting all this love on here, Jerry. I love it. I love it. Well, usually real quick, Mike Peter usually gives me a hard time. Oh, <laughs> but he loves you. He I know, Mike, I love you too. Love. Um, and so what they did is they looked at those 25% and they realized, oh, wow, these are the people who had all this cognitive reserve. And what it was, was people who had uh, higher education, people who were very social, people who had a hobby where over time they could increase their expertise. So, you know, you come in as a beginner, but they kept at it and they kept finding ways to make it more complex and they did it often. Right. And so, you know, they had better diets than other people. And so the idea is that's what we try to focus on with a lot of our education. I was telling you before we went live that 
Um, a lot of how my education program got started was going to retirement communities in North Carolina and trying to um, educate older folks about how to make their brain stronger to make them more resilient against dementia. And so um, that's what we base that's that's that program is basically, you know, what I talk about. Um, and, and actually what we're going to try to do uh, this month is kind of launch that. I have a video series that goes along with that. Um, where we talk about things like, um, you know, over your whole lifetime, you're developing risk factors for dementia, even going back to childhood, which is crazy, right? Yeah. right? And so yeah. um, we're going to try to to do our best and uh, try to get that out to people too. But, you know, it's hard because I get so many messages or emails where, you know, people uh, would like me to comment on their personal situation. And A, it's a little hard legally because of the laws of my psychology license. Um, but also, um, there's just, you know, doing this outreach program is uh, definitely a big part of what we do in the practice. But we're also seeing patients four days a week and have that whole world, too. So um, I wish, you know, if I could clone myself, all she would do would be talk all day long free on the Internet to help people. <laughs> I have to pay the bills. Yeah, no, I agree. But I love the shows on Wednesday at uh, 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in your time. Yeah, right. Okay. Then, right, exactly. Yep. Yeah, uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, here in North Carolina. But then they're always posted on the Facebook page or we have a YouTube channel too, I Care for Your Brain, where there's, you know, at this point over 100 videos on there. I mean, the, it, and what's interesting is some of the most popular ones I've ever done that have like 50,000 views are when yeah. I did specific stroke syndromes. Um, so I know I did one on basal ganglia stroke. Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. So exactly, exactly. Sarah Beller stroke. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think that was really that's almost where I think I got my most followers because people. Oh, God, sometimes people aren't even told where they've had their stroke in their brain. That drives me crazy. I never was. But you you told me. But then, but then if you're lucky enough to be told, okay, it was in your cerebellum, nobody then is educating you. Well, the cerebellum does this physically, this cognitively, this emotionally, and certain senses run through the cerebellum. So then people get discharged and they're like, oh my God, why am I so irritable? I don't seem to have a filter anymore. I'm snapping at people. <laughs> and it's like, it's not you, it's your cerebellum. And, and then what happens is people start to feel bad about themselves and they feel ashamed. And it's kind of like what I was saying before, it feels like a personal issue, like a personality defect when it's a brain problem. Thank you, I can tell Barbara to watch it. Tell Barbara, I mean, now people can still, you know, be jerks and continue to be, you know, unkind, but, but all too often, um, and you've heard me say this, Jerry, the physical signs of brain injury are what take the focus. You know, if you, if a doctor can see it, they believe it. If yeah. they can't see it, you're, you know, and that's as a doctor, the way I try to be is not, I'm here. Let me see if I'm backwards in my camera, not I'm here and the patient's here, but like we're two people who have two different types of expertise, right? So right. a patient always knows more about their condition than me from their point of view, but hopefully I know more about it from kind of this academic medical point. So when people work with their doctor, that's when they get better. But, you know, the medical system is not well <laughs> in yeah. the United States, at least it is unhealthy. There's uh way too many um you know the volume issue you know numbers trying to see as many people as you can and one day you guys all know when you go to the doctor I mean, what are you there for 10 15 minutes i mean it's nothing but you know it is, it is funny all he does is tell me uh, he just goes, oh, i'm sorry <laughs> what do right. you know? Right. I mean, in a way, like, okay, I mean, a little empathy is nice. I mean, I know I've heard other doctors, you know, it's just like you're talking to a robot. And, you know, I, I'm just stereotyping. It, it, there's certainly gems out there. And I certainly, you know, try to collect those people in my practice and, you know, collaborate with them on our patients in North Carolina. But I also hear a lot of bad stories from people. You know, yeah. I see plenty of people who had their stroke two, three, five, ten years ago. And when we meet is the first time 
they've had personalized explanations or an evaluation to be able to say, you know, this is the part of your brain that was injured and here's what it does. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually excited, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm cheating because I'm going to another neuropsychologist and I'm <laughs> cheating on you. Because <laughs> I really, I mean, I wish I would live closer. I wish, you know, or maybe I can, you know, well, that's the way, no, so here's the thing. So we are, um, you know, credentialed with almost all uh, insurances in North Carolina. And even though through COVID and the impact, I'm able to video conference with folks in like, I think it's like 15 different states. It's on our website, um, but I'm not credentialed with those insurance companies. So when we do that, it has to be self-pay, which for yeah. some people is accessible. And for some people it is not. Right. Um, but if you, you know, you should, and this is a service Carrie and I try to provide, is if you email us or message us on Facebook and you give us your zip code in the U.S., um, we will go through a list of board certified folks and connect you because you should, if you have health insurance, you should use it to see a neuropsychologist. Tell your neurologist, tell your primary care doctor, I want to be evaluated by a neuropsychologist and go through that process and see what they have to say. I mean, I think it's the best specialty you've probably, you know, never seen because it's way, like all of our evaluations are about five hours, I would say, between wow. going through medical records, interviews, cognitive testing, and you get an hour of feedback just about you. Here's what we figured out about your brain, Jerry. Here's what you should do next in your rehab to recover as best as you can. Yeah. You don't necessarily get that from a neurologist. You know, uh, to me, it seems like a lot of folks have had their best luck with physical therapists, yeah. occupational therapists, speech therapists, like the folks who are, you know, hands on the ground in your recovery. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, you're right. My neuropsychologist, he was just, uh, I loved him. Yeah. Uh, my old one, he now he retired, but it really made a, a good difference when he didn't give me the intel why maybe you were born with in just a matter of time you're gonna have a stroke that's all he told me really yeah that was it before you had your stroke that's what he said no after i had the stroke he told me that because oh. people ask me why did you have it i don't know so i asked the the, the neuro and he uh he's well i think you were born with it it's just a matter of time <laughs> so okay so that's what i was telling people oh. back, back you know 10 years ago a while did he say you had like a avm as they call it jerry like a, a arterial venous malformation you know he never did i wonder what that means i don't know it's so funny i ordered again my records again so they should be here any day and i'm so excited um maybe i could uh bother you one time and just yeah of course i mean I think knowing why you had your stroke is an important part of healing. And yeah. you know, there's some people who have the, you know, cryptic strokes where they don't have an explanation. And I think that's specifically hard. Um, but, you know, that's one of the, the rules of rehab that we talked about is you have to know your risk factors, what led to the stroke, so you can prevent a second one. Yes. That's so, and if you don't know what you're supposed to be controlling, I think people can feel really lost. And, you know, a big part of being a neuropsychologist and what I try to validate for people is the emotional side of stroke. Mm -hmm. Again, it could be brain-based, anxiety, depression. I mean, these things aren't, it really brings up these like deep questions about like philosophy and like, who are we, right? It's like, are we just our brain, you know, yeah. Yeah. but whatever you think you're, to me, you know, you're a, a spiritual person and it runs through your brain. Your brain is like the lens yes. for this life, you know? So your lens in your emotional center could be a little cracked from the stroke. And, you know, what happens if you do struggle with neuro fatigue so bad you can't do the therapies that would help you, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, and again, that's where a neuropsychologist comes in. It's not just about the MRI. It's like, how are you adjusting to the stroke? And you know, post-stroke depression is extremely real and it's the biggest barrier to people getting better and it's treatable. Right, right. But if no one ever asks you the question, 
about depression, then you're never going to get diagnosed and then treated. Right. That's the thing. I, I hear this probably 100% of the time when I talk in all my stroke friends and it's the, it's the um, isolation they feel. Yeah. Uh-huh. No one understands unless you talk to another. That, I hear that. That's why, that's why you guys do so such a service for each other through social media. I mean, that's who's saving the day in the brain health community. It's not the doctors. It's right? the survivors. Yeah. It's survivors who take their experience and communicate with other survivors. You guys yeah. are truly the heroes. It's it's totally true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I completely understand. Then there was uh, one other thing too. There was a, uh, um, so your lectures, which I, I, they're all, all science-based, right? Oh yeah. That's what really started this, Jerry, all those three years ago was I was so sick and tired of my patients coming in, telling me about the BS supplements that they were taking, spending all their money on not doing real therapy because they figured this pill was going to be the cure. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's this whole world of brain science that is in the academic ivory towers and nobody is communicating it to the very people who need it. And I feel so privileged to have gone to, you know, some of the most prestigious schools in the United States, you know, through the grace of God and other people's, you know, kindness and my hard work. But if I just sat with that information in my head, to yeah. me, I wouldn't be living my values of helping people. I felt like I couldn't not share. And so that's when we had this idea of, okay, well, Facebook is free. I could get on there. It's a pebble in the pond, but at least it's something. Right. And over time, you know, um, hopefully we're going to get to about 10,000 followers. I'm hoping maybe this summer. And that's kind of my master plan to tell you the truth is if I can get enough views on Facebook and YouTube, Maybe somebody will yeah. then see that and say, like, okay, let's get her a bigger platform so I can reach more people. Right. Like, that's kind of the the dream. Yeah. So whatever you when your folks come on Facebook and see the, you know, lecture sharing them really helps. I'm um, getting more people to like and follow the page. I think that's how I'm gonna get my power to have more of an effect. I really don't know what else to do, to tell you the truth. If you guys have you know, ideas about trying to get a bigger audience that's, you know, send them to us, help us. <laughs> yeah, no, that I, I, cause I know that when I watch your show and I know salute and a bunch of other people, I, everybody's sharing it to oh, other, you guys are so other great. You guys, you guys are so good to me and how I really feel is like, we're all in this together. Yeah. We just need to um, get more people who have, more opportunities to share the information. You know, I mean, one of the things I thought of doing, you know, trying to get more time in the next couple months is I think what would be really interesting is to film me doing an evaluation with someone, like oh, go wow. through the whole interview, you know, have people understand the questions we ask, how kind of resonates and collates mind, how I then pick the tests that we use and how we interpret the tests and then how we give the feedback to people. It's like really a beautiful, it's almost like a, a drama that happens every day in our practice. The experience of getting to know someone, looking through their records, finding all the little pieces of gold that help us understand them. I think it's fascinating. I think people might appreciate that whole experience of, of going through that. That's just one idea. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I love that idea. Oh, you're so nice, Jerry. But you know, people are saying, yeah, there's no magic pill. I mean, I think honestly, there's a special place in hell for people who try to sell quick fixes to the brain health community because, you know, <laughs> of course, waste of money, uh, waste of time. If you're busy playing a you know game that you think is going to heal your brain, you're not busy engaging with people, you know, exercising, eating better foods. You know, like I said before, brain health is going to be a program of information. It's never going to just be one thing, you know, but really the cruelest thing they do is take people's hope. I mean, that's the worst thing of all. And that that's really the deception is to say, uh, if only, you know, you could get this program, if only, you know, you would take these pills, um, you know, you could, 
not have your problems. It's just ridiculous. You do a lot of, do any of them, they come in to see you or uh, virtually, do any test of it for me a long time? I hear this too. Um, a year after I was out of the hospital, I went to um, outpatient therapy. They told me I plateaued. Oh, yeah, that's so yeah, I've seen such improvements, you know, still yeah. to this day. Yeah, Jerry, again, I think that's one of the services you provide the community is to say recovery is never ending. Don't right. ever let someone tell you you've plateaued. I mean, there is this idea. I mean, there is some truth to the idea that the earlier, the better. However, it's truly never too late. And the idea is you need the map. And that's exactly why, I mean, really that's the reason i wrote the book is okay let's say you're told that by the medical community that you're done this is a plateau the science disagrees if you go to science they tell you i mean through animal models and human models you can kickstart rehab at any time the more you put in the more you're going to get back but where can people turn for a trustworthy guide to know what to do right you know and like just using i think rule number two is repetition and consistency. You could tell me, Jerry, open the book and tell me if I'm right. Yeah. Repetitioning. And so if you just go to, you know, insurance covered physical therapy in the right. United States, right? You're going to get like, I don't know, eight to 12 sessions. When you go in there, they might have you do like 30 repetitions, right? Right. So if you look at the animal literature, like they give an animal a sham stroke, you know, they go inside their basal ganglia and they make a blood vessel hemorrhage, you know? Right. Not very nice, but this is how science, you know. Yeah. Moves. And then they have a, uh, you know, they attach them to a treadmill and they have them do the type of repetition that you would get in typical therapy. Yeah, there's a little improvement and after a few months it's nothing but if you actually increase the repetition significantly like nine to ten times the amount of reps you would do in traditional therapy oh wow these animals just keep getting better and better and better yeah so i'm not a conspiracy theorist but i will tell you i don't trust uh the system of what is typically prescribed for stroke recovery and i don't think it's a coincidence I mean, how could we expect the people who are paying for it to believe the science that it should go on for five years, right? Because then they'd have to pay for it. So yeah. of course they perpetuate the myth that there's a limited window, it's only a year, it's only two years. I mean, they're the ones who are paying the bill. So what the heck? Yeah, exactly. And I, I wonder if Carrie or somebody put, you had uh, on one of your shows, actually was it one of the uh, sessions about the, uh, um, the mirror therapy because I use that all the time and that 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 really works when like Barb looking at the, the hand and I feel I'm doing it she could see that it's working isn't that so cool I mean that was something that this neuroscientist named Ramachandran came out with in California like 30 years ago when I was like an undergrad I was and he invented mirror therapy to help people with phantom pain who had an amputation wasn't even done with stroke for years and years but I love practical like DIY homegrown interventions recovery shouldn't be I mean tech can help like I'm super impressed with that what's the name of the hand thing you're using the Morris Nova hand mentor Awesome. I'm following what you're doing. It looks amazing. And of course, there's a place for that. Yeah. But there's also a place for setting up a mirror. Yes. A $2 store mirror and tricking your brain into thinking your affected hand is back to working perfectly. Yeah, it does. It works. That's science. It doesn't have to be fancy or inaccessible, right? And so that's the kind of stuff that drew me into neuropsychology. My whole dissertation when I was getting my PhD at Boston University was about folks with Alzheimer's disease really struggle with making food, like following a recipe and making the, you know, their traditional dishes in the kitchen, right? Yeah. Well, that's very like emotionally important to people. You know, grandma always makes the dip or, you know, mom always made the molasses cookies, right? <laughs> so one of the things we know about folks with Alzheimer's is they have vision issues. They have a hard time with contrast. So what we did is we took 
materials that were made for people with legal blindness, like take a measuring cup and make it black and white instead of clear. Yeah. And people with Alzheimer's were able to get back in the kitchen and measure things more accurately. So that's just an example to say, if you just always bring it back to the people, I and mean, I think that's part of my background you had asked me before, Jerry, is I was a caregiver for yeah. about eight years before I ever went to school. I was a, you know, eighth, ninth grade high school dropout, started doing caregiving in my New Jersey community and worked, you know, in the home and, you know, in facilities with people for years and years before I went to school. And I, I think that's an important thing is doctors should have to work in the field to understand the human element, not just come at this stuff from books. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and a lot of people, because uh, I think that I, I, I look a lot of uh, research and it says um, uh, 23% of us uh, will have another stroke if we do not take care of ourselves. Right, right. But, you know, it takes a village, doesn't it, Jerry? Yeah. Right? But here's my other motivation is if someone didn't have a support person in their world, you know, marriages sometimes can't make it through a stroke recovery. At least if people had a trustworthy voice, you know, in my videos where they could get support, get validation, get guidance, it's better than the alternative, yeah. right? Um, so, you know, I worry sometimes somebody mentioned something like, oh, get a, a wider platform. I would love that. You know, we worry like, what if Facebook gets canceled? What if, you know, there's a lot of issues yeah. with Facebook, you know, so all our, our folks are on there. So Carrie and I are brainstorming about, you know, switching some kind of platform or but you know your your people are so supportive i see some comments like oh maybe i could help by getting you in touch with this person Anyone, yeah you know who wants to just go to our facebook page and message you know me and carrie's my right hand person helps me with everything um we'll definitely get back to people and figure out how to work together to spread the word yeah exactly and i know we talked a long time about uh i wish i had like a ton of these rehab things i'm gonna have to buy these to take them to the hospital to show because i i mean i have experiences i don't think i've ever heard except for you telling people this stroke recovery guide you know instead of being kicked to the curb after therapy you know yeah. that's why i've switched many times to different um like hospitals or rehab facilities so i can get more um more sessions and start all over because they you know they uh Tell me, and all of you heard that too. You go to therapy, and then they think you're you're good to go home. They give me the T-shirt and see you later. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it too is their expectations of recovery, yeah. right? And yeah. So the idea, I mean, I've seen it sometimes with speech therapy. It's like, okay, well, the person can, uh, you know, write their name. They can, you know, they know their address. It's like the bar is like here. Yeah. You know, that is especially true for people who have, quote, mild deficits, right? And so yeah. rehab is really geared in the U.S. for people with severe deficits. And thank God, of course, those people need it. But what's mild to a doctor is devastating to a person. Yeah. Right? And so um, those are the folks that are listening to you. A lot of those people are the ones who to find us on the internet. And, you know, there's just a lot of gaps in the, the healthcare system and it's just ridiculous. And so I, I think education is the best solution that, that I've been able to come up with. And I mean, it's kind of sad really, just, it should just be a standard part of people's neurological care. It should, right. just, I mean, you should meet with you know, a neuropsychologist who helps you understand your unique deficits. Here's your personalized rehab plan. Let's check in every three months and see what else we can change up to keep getting you more and more function. But right. it doesn't, I mean, unless people can pay for it, it really doesn't exist. And even then people go bankrupt trying yeah. to get better. Yeah. Cause most stroke survivors end up, they lose their, well, you probably, you obviously, you know, they, they use, lose their income and they oh. can't afford, you know, insurance and all that and so they just they feel they plateau and they're just going to sit and do nothing and i've yeah. talked to so many people and that that happens so trying to motivate these people these stroke survivors out there 
Um, uh, that that's the, it's such an awesome thing that you're doing, and so many other folks like you. I know Salud and and her husband have their show, and you know so many awesome people commenting here. Um, but you know it's such an important thing to to see advocacy in action. But you know I also know that there's people who are listening who aren't there yet, and yeah. you know it's uh, the opportunity to feel bad about yourself. Like why haven't I used my stroke to help other people? Well, guess what? It's a journey. Yeah. And it's, you know, we talked about this a lot in the group is post-traumatic stress disorder related to stroke. If you haven't gone through the full circle of acknowledging what changed or what you lost, yes, validating the loss, grieving the loss, you don't find the silver lining until you go through all those other steps. And then the silver lining is the, how can I reduce someone else's pain based on my own? Yes, that was, that was a kind of one of the last questions I was thinking, um, why do we have to acknowledge our trauma? I, we, that was in your, uh, one of the 10 sessions. That's right. Yeah. That yeah. was almost my favorite one because that kind of pain can feel very uh, private and personal yeah. to people because there's not enough. <laughs> Mike is cracking. Right, he does this all the time. He, he's, yeah. And Mike and his wife is a priest. Oh, but is he the guy from South Wales? Yeah. Oh my God. Hilarious. Um, okay. Three coughs, Jerry. That's so funny. Um, so PTSD after a stroke is extremely real. And again, people feel very alone with their symptoms. For example, stress and anxiety about going back into the room in your house where you had your stroke, right? Had the yeah. stroke in the bathroom hate the bathroom now, don't want to go in the bathroom, get palpitations when I have to go in the bathroom, you know, you start to avoid because in the moment, that's how you reduce your anxiety. Well, I'll just avoid it. I avoid hospital. You know how many people, I, I wouldn't go to a hospital now if I was dying. I hate the smell. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> so sad. I loved the food. I loved everything. Did and, you I, really? yeah, and I didn't want to come home. Oh my God, Jerry, you loved it. You loved the TLC. That's what it was. You had people taking care of you. Oh, that's but, so funny. Sorry to interrupt you, though. But. That's so funny. Well, here, Jason just, just gave me a beautiful contribution. I used to have panic attacks when I would hear helicopters and ambulances. 100%, that's a post-traumatic stress disorder symptom. And if you don't get treatment, your world gets smaller. Okay, so at first you start off not, not being able to tolerate the sound of an ambulance, right? So an ambulance comes by, you know, you don't, you know, you hide when you hear ambulances. Well, guess what? Over time, it becomes maybe a fear of cars. Then it can become a fear of leaving the house. Now, all of a sudden, you're in the house and you don't want to leave. So trauma makes your world smaller and smaller. The way we, I mean, trauma is trauma, whether it's military, yeah. sexual assault, stroke. Yeah. It's unexpected. It was life-threatening. It changed the way you see yourself or the world, right? Exactly. What we know about trauma therapy is the first thing is you have to acknowledge how it impacted you. Yeah. What changed? So maybe after a stroke, you know, I no longer feel safe in my body. True. I mean, do you ever hear, because I, wherever, oh, it's right, my cell phone never leaves my side, even in bed. Right. Exactly. Because I've had that, a seizure. When no one's home, so my but my uh, so that's that's the only thing that really helps right. me. And so even if we took that a step further, Jerry, it's like your sense of safety, basic life or death safety, is now changed forever. And even when you go through successful PTSD treatment, it's not like you forget about it. I mean, the whole successful treatment is you integrate your trauma and your loss into who you are now. Yeah. And over time, it feels like there's some meaning in your story. Yeah, exactly. But you can't jump the line and then get to, you know, you have to acknowledge the grief. You have to, you know, you got to cry. You got to express. You can't pretend it didn't happen and try to go on. It did happen and it's very real. But the stroke community doesn't have professional guides. Like, let's just say you acknowledge you have PTSD, right? And you call your insurance company and you say, I want to go to a therapist. Well, there's a great chance that therapist has no idea what a stroke is like. 
doesn't understand how parts of the brain could be affected and give you anxiety or depression. Right. So you don't even have the professional who can really map on to what you're going through. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you know, and so that's why it's so important that neuropsychologists are understood as an option for people, you know, especially in the U S again, that's kind of all I know. I'd love to hear Mike seems to, you know, be very comfortable chiming in. Mike, tell us about, <laughs> tell us about neuropsychology in England. I know that there are some, um, but for example, like if you went to the NHS and you asked to see a neuropsychologist, what would that process be like? If you happen to know, I would be curious. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe he can chime in on the um, on the comments later uh, if he has to think about it. And uh, yeah, yeah. So well, Carrie is so she's so good. She just put up a link too. Because this PTSD conversation is very important. There's a free lecture she just linked to. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. Because I think a lot of people don't understand that that's what they're having when they have panic attacks and when they start to avoid things. Yeah. In one of the lectures, the, the sessions, and I can't remember, it was about the, uh, you have to uh, check these boxes. Do you have PTSD? Are you feeling, my gosh. <laughs> Duh, like, oh my, I oh, holy smokes. Right. And you know, your brain, your life history matters. You didn't just come into the stroke a blank slate. I mean, that's another whole misstep is, you know, now your only identity is stroke survivor. Well, that's like the least interesting thing about you, Jerry. I mean, you're a pilot, you're a father, you're a grandfather, you're hilarious, you're kind, you know, seriously. And so yeah, we want to make sure we're still respecting, you know, people's life history, but especially if you've been traumatized before your stroke, you are at very high risk. You know, if you had child abuse, were neglected, were in the military and, and were traumatized, you know, had a car accident. Um, okay. So Mike saying in Wales, there's none. Oh my gosh. Not seen anyone since my stroke. Oh, I hate that for you, Mike. That's yeah. terrible. You know, I'm going to look into that because I know there's some people in England and I know um, I've looked up uh, Scotland. I know there's some there. I wonder if they would allow you to do telehealth in another part of the UK. That might be something to look into. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's just unnecessary suffering. Why do, why, why is it so inaccessible to get support after a stroke? It's just, it blows my mind. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Did, well, here's the thing though, you guys, I have to get going because yeah. I have a patient at 12 o'clock. So I got to get back to my job. Well, this is perfect. Cause they, they were ending at well, 12, your time, 11, my time. Okay. And cool. then, again, did, any last uh, going words? Cause this oh. has been awesome. My just, goodness. You guys, all you guys, just keep up the good work. Stay in your community. Keep talking. Keep listening to Jerry. Keep sending each other support and tips. Like I said, you guys are really the heroes in this brain health community as it stands in 2021. I'm trying to bring in my community, the medical community. I'll do as much as I can for you. Um, you guys have my whole attention and my my whole heart. So come on over to our website. See if there's anything there that might support you even further. And just try your best to stay on track with your recovery. And make sure everybody tomorrow, uh, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Yes. Dr. Selman's show. And all science-based. And you've got to see it. Don't miss it, please. And I will remind everybody. So uh, thank you, you again. You guys are the best. You guys have a great day, okay? See you guys. Okay, bye. Bye.